Good morning, everyone. Wow, there's a whole crowd of kids up in the back there. So glad you guys could be in here and see the baptism. Have a great time in Sunday school, guys. And congrats to Matthias and to the Gauntly family. I am so excited for them. I hope you guys get to spend some time together celebrating as a family and um, just rejoicing in what God is doing. Uh, our family's had some good times together recently uh, re-watching the TV series Lost. Anybody remember Lost? Yeah, um, it was on the air from 2004 to 2010, and it was hugely popular. There was all kinds of craziness around this show. It won Emmy Awards, it won a Golden Globe, and when it ended, there was this huge backlash over the ending. Some people were so angry and disappointed with how it had finally wrapped up, and other people loved it. So it was one of those examples of a highly polarizing conversation, like we have been learning about recently. As people who hadn't seen the ending yet literally had to go around like covering their ears so they wouldn't hear any spoilers about the big reveal. And somehow or other, I did manage to get away without hearing about the ending, so I'm looking forward to finding out what it is soon, uh, even though I'm over a decade late. That's okay. Don't anybody come and tell me afterwards how Lost ends, okay? I don't want to know. But the thing about this show that was so captivating is that it always is revealing new information and new clues that are supposed to fit together in some kind of a big plan, some big conspiracy theory. Something's going on and you've got to pay attention to all these little clues. We just, we love it when clues fit together in a pattern, don't we? We love it when a bunch of things that seem random come together and make sense. We can see this in everything from you know, murder mysteries to scientific theories. We get really excited when there's new information that fits into our theories. I would go even so far as to say that as human beings, we were created to thrive on revelation. We're captivated when something new is revealed. And we can't wait to tell others what we've discovered. This is why the news exists, because we want to tell people about those aha moments of discovery in science or in technology or in education, in medicine, in, our, in health, right? We want to hear what's new. And God knows this about us, of course. He, loves, he knows we love to learn and discover new things because he made us that way with this innate curiosity about the world and how it works. And if we just look at the creation around us, we can see all these mysteries that he's given us to solve and all the discoveries we haven't even made yet. Did you know that the National Geographic Society says that 80% of the ocean has never been mapped, explored, or even seen by humans? And that's just the undiscovered part of Earth, right? If you think of space, it gets even more incredible. The scientists believe that the diameter of the observable universe is about 93 billion light years. Try to wrap your head around that for a second. 93 billion light years. And we haven't even gotten a person to Mars yet, which is only 12.7 light minutes away compared to 93 billion light years. Why would God give us such a huge universe with so much in it to discover unless he made us to thrive on new discoveries? So it isn't surprising, I think, that according to the Bible, God's plan throughout human history was to gradually reveal more and more of himself. We get to discover more of God. He gave one prophet at a time and one key event at a time and it fits together into his plan and purpose for us. And then once we encountered his big reveal in Jesus Christ, he gave us the mission to go and tell others what we had discovered. And that is why we're doing a sermon series on sharing our faith, which Brian started for us last week. It's God's plan for us to understand what he's revealed and then tell others about it. And so the passage that we're looking at today in Luke 10 might seem a bit confusing at first. You're going to wonder how on earth I got where I got, but it's okay. Just try and follow me. I'm trying to follow Jesus' train of thought. It wasn't easy at first. 
But I've realized this week that it's that theme of revelation, of new things being revealed, that really underlies what Jesus is teaching about here. So if you've got a Bible, or if you want to grab one from the pew, or pull it up on your phone, we're in Luke 10, verses 17 to 24. And it's going to be on the screen behind me as well. If you were here last week, then you know the context of these verses is that Jesus has sent out 72 of his followers. They're going in pairs to all the places that he's heading, and their job is to prepare the villages for his arrival, to tell them that the kingdom of heaven is near and that they should repent and get ready. He gave them authority to heal the sick and to cast out demons. And he told them, don't take it personally if people reject you, because they're not really rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So let's pick it up then in verse 17, when the disciples come back to him. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So what was going on here? The disciples came back from their assignment, really excited and impressed by their power. And of course, we know it wasn't really their power. It was the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that Jesus had given them by his authority. But Jesus affirmed that the power was real. He says he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, which means that they were victorious in the spiritual realm and what they were doing. They were powerful, and so are we. We've been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit recently. That was our last series. We know the Spirit can do powerful things through us. Miracles of healing and deliverance from demons and visions and prophecy and all kinds of things as he chooses. 1 John 4.4 promises us that the one who is in us, that's the Holy Spirit, is greater than the one who's in the world, the devil. So we don't have to be afraid of anything, Jesus says, But we don't get to take any credit for that. That's God at work within us. Without him, we can do nothing. So Jesus is affirming their excitement, but he's also redirecting them. He says, don't rejoice the spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Don't be excited about the power you've been granted, as real as that is. Be excited about the undeserved grace that you've received. You can't take credit for the power. And you can't take credit for the free gift of your salvation. All of it's God's gift. All of it is his graciousness to you. So rejoice that he's had mercy on you and on anyone who humbles themselves and asks for forgiveness. But then it says something surprising, I think. Verse 21 says that Jesus was so full of joy in the Holy Spirit that he started to pray aloud and praise the Father. Why? What? caused him to spontaneously burst into praise in that moment. Well, thankfully, he tells us the reason. He says, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. And I didn't really get that at first. Why is that such a joyful thought for Jesus? I get why the disciples are joyful. They had discovered the power they had in Jesus. And they still didn't really understand who Jesus was, but they saw him doing good things for their community and got to be part of that. So they rejoiced because of the miracles they saw. But that's not why Jesus was rejoicing. He had a deeper joy. He says it's because these things that had been hidden were being revealed. What things? Well, I think these things is is a way of encompassing all of Jesus' teachings about himself 
about, about God and as well as all the ways that the disciples can be changed and transformed and made new. You know, through Jesus, the character of God and the love of God for everyone was being revealed. The way of salvation was being opened so that through faith in Christ, our names could be written in heaven. And through faith in Christ, we could receive the power to be like him and do the things that he did. And the disciples were discovering that. So basically, we could sum up these things as the good news, the gospel. But that good news, Jesus says, has been hidden from the proud, from the rich, the smartest and most important people of his day. The Pharisees and the other religious and political leaders could not accept what Jesus was saying. They couldn't accept grace because they were the best rule followers that there were. They liked that position of superiority. Grace would make all of their hard work irrelevant. So God was turning all of the world's values upside down. He was revealing himself to those who were supposedly the least important, the ones who were sick, the ones who were oppressed, the ones who were uneducated, the ones who were addicted to their sin, the widows and the orphans who had no power at all in their society. Those are the people that God is revealing himself to to those who have no other source of hope. He's giving them the promise of redemption and wholeness and healing, justice and purpose and eternal life. So this is a wonderful, joyful reversal of the status quo. It's God setting things right, putting his kingdom in order. Jesus is so joyful because the good news is coming to those who need it the most. And the rich and powerful oppressors are now the ones who are missing out. But not only that, Jesus is joyful because he gets to be part of revealing God and his salvation to the world. Jesus is the bringer and the embodiment of the good news. This is his point in verse 22, where he says, The Father has committed everything to him, and the Father's the only one who knows him, and Jesus is the only one who knows the Father. And he now has the privilege and the joy of revealing the Father to those that he chooses. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, it affirms that Jesus had a very unique role in revealing God. It said, the Son, that's Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So Jesus had the most joyful assignment and the most painful that any human being could ever have. Because even though he was God in the flesh, he was also human. And at this moment, his human nature is rejoicing in this incredible assignment that he's been given to be the revealer of God and his salvation to the world. God's revealing himself to the most needy and the most unlikely people through him. And so he bursts into praise. So in a nutshell, Jesus is joyful here for two reasons. Because the good news of salvation is being revealed and because he gets to be part of it. And he praises God for this. And then he turns to his disciples, and what he's saying is he's encouraging them to rejoice in those same things. He says to them, blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So he's saying to them, Don't you understand the enormous gift that you've been given? You've seen the big reveal, the physical embodiment of God in me. Humanity has been waiting thousands of years for this moment. Everything that God has said and done in the past has been leading up to this. And you've had the privilege not just to see me from afar, but to know me and spend time with me and learn from me. What a gift. What a blessing. So Jesus is saying, don't miss that incredible joy of the assignment you've been given. You now get to be part of that big reveal. You get to tell the rest of the world. You're the first ones to tell the rest of the world that in Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins and peace with God is possible. You get to go tell people that there's a plan and a purpose 
for all of creation and that God is finally bringing that plan to completion in Christ. You get to announce to all who will hear it that you can have a relationship with God that's not based on earning his favor or following the rules, but simply on faith and trust. You get to do that. And he's not just speaking to the disciples, is he? We need to hear this message. We get to do that. It helps if we go back to some of the prophets and the joy that they expressed in foretelling about Jesus. They didn't actually get to see the big reveal themselves, but they knew it was coming, and they were rejoicing even 500 years before Christ. The prophet Isaiah, who wrote in about 538 BC, he said in Isaiah 40, 9 to 11, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Do you hear that joy and that excitement in Isaiah's voice? If he could be this thrilled just by a vision of the Messiah, then how would he have felt if he had seen Jesus in the flesh the way the disciples did? The prophet Micah put it this way in Micah chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they'll live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And then again we have Zechariah. We read his joyful words about Jesus on every Palm Sunday. He says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So these are just three examples. But over and over again, the prophets of Israel, Israel foretold with joy, down to the smallest details, the coming of the person who would bring salvation, the Messiah. And the disciples got to meet him. And they got to receive the great commission that is the mission for all of Jesus' disciples until he returns, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now, the disciples didn't understand this right away. They weren't bursting into praise with Jesus, were they? They didn't really know what was happening or how privileged and special they were to have been with Jesus. But later, the Holy Spirit did help them to understand it to the point that all of them laid down their lives in one way or another to bring the good news of salvation to the people who hadn't heard it. And Paul, who was the last of the apostles to meet Christ, he understood it the best. This is what he wrote in Ephesians 3, 4 to 6, talking about his own letter to them. He said, in reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So Paul understood that the people of God had now been entrusted with a precious mystery that previous generations didn't know about. It was the plan of God in Christ to save the entire world. And it was his job, and now our job, to go and reveal and explain that mystery to others. It's like we've found out the end of the best TV show ever made. We should be excited to talk about it with others, more excited than the people in 2010 who couldn't help talking about the ending of Lost. People should have to avoid us or cover their ears if they don't want to hear the gospel because we can't shut up about it. If we can spread the news 
about the discovery of a vaccine for COVID across the world in a matter of weeks, what is wrong with us that it's taken over 2,000 years and we still haven't told everybody about Jesus? How have we lost our excitement over what we've been given? We should have the same attitude that Jesus had here in Luke 10. We should be bursting into praise over the fact that God has made a way of salvation and we get to be part of it. We get to reveal it to the world. We should be thrilled to have been chosen to be part of this mission. Now, I'm preaching to myself, okay? Because more, most of the time, as Christians, we're stressing about the fact that we should be sharing our faith, right? We feel obligated, we feel guilty, we feel frustrated, we don't know how to talk to this or that person, we feel afraid. But what Jesus is saying here and what Paul was saying is that we should be delighted that we get to share our faith. We get to. We have this privilege. And the prophets that I read from earlier, Isaiah and Micah and Zechariah, they would have given their right arm for the privilege of delivering the message that we have. Even the apostle Peter, who was arguably the least perceptive of the disciples, he actually understood in the end the privilege that he had. He said this in 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. He said, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who've preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. So you guys, what he's saying is that the prophets of old and the angels were envious of us. They wanted to know what we now know and have the mission that we now have. Everything the prophets wrote down in the scriptures was for us, for our benefit, so that we would be equipped to share the gospel with others. We've got the Bible in our language, in multiple versions. We've got thousands of books and commentaries to help us understand it. Or if you're not into books and commentaries, you can watch videos on YouTube. You, we've got our own personal stories of how Jesus has changed us and met us and encouraged us. And we've got God himself, the Holy Spirit, within us to give us the right words at the right time when we need them. So what more could we possibly need? What are we waiting for? At what point will we have enough to start telling people about Jesus? Now, I know that this is starting to sound like a guilt trip, because I feel it too. But that's not my intention, okay? Guilt is never going to motivate us to share our faith with joy the way it needs to be shared. So the only way to be motivated to share what God has done is to truly understand what he's done with our whole being. It's got to move from knowing it into our hearts. We've got to understand what Jesus did with our heart and mind and soul. And when we fully understand that big reveal of God in Christ, then nothing will be able to stop us from talking about it. That's what we saw with the disciples. So we're gonna to come to the communion table today and we're gonna to come with joy. I want us to come with a deep desire to understand what Jesus has given us to the point that when we leave, we won't be able to help talking about it. I want us, as Jesus uh, offered, I want us to come to him and drink so that rivers of living water will flow out from us to others. So I'm gonna move down to the table and if you're watching at home, now's the point that you need to get out your bread and your juice so that you can participate with us. And for those of you that are here in person, if you don't have one of those little packets, um, one of these, just raise your hand and the ushers will bring you one. Okay, don't be shy. Yes, put, put your hands up. I see quite a few up here at the front, Dennis. 
is coming around. Donna's over on this side, if anybody, right there. Too many of you snuck in side doors, I think, because you got to come in the main doors to get your communion. <laughs> and you guys know how these work, right? The little top purple layer opens, you get the wafer out, and the juice is in the bottom portion, okay? Anybody else missing one? Oh, we've got one up here on the wing, Donna. Okay, and at the back, does everybody have? And one here? We're going to get this. We're getting it together. Right here down the center aisle, Dennis. Thank you. Okay. So at this table, we celebrate the gospel. We celebrate the good news of salvation in Christ. And what is that good news? We can sum it up in three words. Okay, I'm going to teach you something here at the table. CBC. Creation, brokenness, and Christ. If you want a simple way to explain the gospel to friends or family, creation, brokenness, Christ. Okay, creation. God created the world to be beautiful and perfect. He created us to live in a relationship with him. We see the evidence of his good design all around us in nature, in the animals, in the love between people. The creation itself points us to God, the creator. But there's brokenness. The world is not perfect anymore, the way God intended. It's broken. There's evil in the world. There's death and there's sin and there's suffering and people hurt each other and hurt themselves. And we ourselves are broken inside. We're selfish and we're greedy and we're vengeful and we're proud. So our lives are messed up and broken. And so our relationship with God is broken too because he's perfect and he's holy. And as broken human beings, we can't have the kind of relationship with him that he intended. We're not capable of it. And so God sent us Christ. God sacrificed his own perfect son to take away our sin, to heal us, to restore us and reconnect us with God. Jesus died, and he was raised again to life to defeat death and sin forever. And now, when we surrender our lives to Jesus in repentance from our sin and in faith in what he's done, then we're reborn and we're given new life. We're new creations. So we're back to the first word again. It goes in a circle. Creation, brokenness, Christ, and back to new creation again. We get to be filled with the spirit of life that is our guarantee that we're going to live forever with him. And that that perfect creation that God intended will one day be restored. So we can have hope and we can have joy and we can have peace because of Christ. No matter what we go through in this broken world, we can have the presence of God with us and within us. We can start to become the people that he always intended for us to be. So this broken world, we know it's not the end. Jesus promised he's going to come again. And what started with his death and resurrection is going to be brought to completion. The kingdom of God that Jesus talked about so often, that new creation is going to be fully realized on earth. And so that, all of that, creation and brokenness and Christ and new creation, that's what we're celebrating here at the table. We're looking backwards at what he did, and we're looking forwards to what he's going to do. The original creation, and then all its brokenness, and the sacrifice of Christ to save it, and then we're anticipating that new creation that has already begun in us. We can already see it at work. So Jesus gave us this ceremony so that we could meditate on all of that often, because he knows we need to be reminded Every day, actually, we need to be reminded of the gospel and of how good it is and how blessed we are to have it. And that's why the Apostle Paul told us that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This ceremony is a proclamation of the gospel. So would you 
pray with me now that we could fully understand what we are doing here today and what has been done for us. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that so often we have walked around not appreciating, not understanding the good news, even though we've heard it a million times. Lord, would you take those blinders off so that we would see and rejoice? In your word, it says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. God, we want to see your glory. As we sang earlier, we want you to show us Christ. Show us what we're missing. That incredible love that you have to give everything for people who don't appreciate it. Lord, we repent. We want to turn back to you. We want to be excited again at what you've done for us. Jesus, we're so grateful for the sacrifice that you made. Thank you for putting up with us. Thank you for allowing yourself to be crucified by people who didn't know what they were doing, didn't know what you were doing. Lord, we're so ignorant, but you love us so much. Thank you, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. We know that that's possible because of what you did. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew 26, it says that while the disciples were eating with Jesus, at his last meal before his death, knowing what was going to happen to him, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. When you're ready, you can take a moment of silence first if you like, but when you're ready, partake of the bread and remember what Jesus has done for you. Then Jesus took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Lord, we thank you that you've promised to come back and to drink with us to fellowship with us, to set the world right back to the way you intended it to be. Lord, thank you for washing away all of our sins and giving us that new covenant that is not by law, not by following rules, not by having to understand everything, but just by faith and trust in you. So Lord, we just express our gratitude and our thanks. We don't have the words, but we know you hear the cry of our hearts. Amen. Let's drink together. This is Romans 16, 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all the Gentiles, that's us, 
that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen.